Welcome everyone to this type of elective lecture series. Uh, please don't forget to tell us where you're joining us in the chat. And if you have questions uh, as you go, please add them in the Q&A or in the chats. So again, thank you all for joining us. We are Type Electives. We're an online design school shaping the future of type. We're co-founded by Lin Yun and myself, Juan Villanueva. We offer courses that go beyond traditional type design education, which include a large range of live online classes that are focused on letter forms, including type design, lettering, and creative technology. Our faculty is made up of people who approach their practice from a place of respect, responsibility, criticality, and love. And we're excited to work with students who are interested in exploring a future that is founded in those principles. Today is the third lecture of our spring lecture series, where we invite new and established voices to share their stories, knowledge, and ideas with the community. Our theme for this season is about community and collaboration. And we have a great lineup of friends and collaborators whose work and practice we find really inspiring and we want to share that with the community. So today we're gonna to be hearing from Silas Monroe and Brian Johnson, who are the partners of Polymode, a bicoastal, queer, and minority-owned graphic design studio leading the edge of design through with thought-provoking work for clients and in the cultural sphere. Uh, reminder that all, the, all of our talks in the series are recorded and they will be made available on our website shortly after. But before I introduce properly our main speakers, just want to remind you to subscribe to our newsletter uh, to stay up to date with our latest courses. And if you can donate, please do so. Your support helps us provide scholarships and make education more accessible. So without further ado, I want to introduce Salas Monroe, a designer, artist, writer, and curator. He is the founder of the LGBTQ plus and minority owned graphic design studio Polymode. Um, he's also the curator and author of Strike Through, Typographic Messages of Protest, which op opened a letter from archive in 2022-2023. He was a contributor of the W.E.B. Du Bois Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America, and co-authored the, the first BIPOC-centered design history course, Black Design in America, African Americans, and the African Diaspora in Graphic Design from 19th to the 21st century. Uh, Monroe is faculty co-chair for the MFA program in graphic design at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. Uh, Brian Johnson is an award-winning designer and partner of Polymode, passionately champions marginalized voices through his work. He delves into the interdisciplinary approaches using poetic research, impactful design, and immersive learning to amplify forgotten narratives. Uh, with a rich background in scholarship, he has shared his expertise through lectures and workshops, institutions from the Art Institute of Chicago to AGA National Design Conferences, co-founding BIPOC Design History underscores his commitment to inclusive education. He's also a member of the Monacan Indian Nation and holds a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. As a curator, as a curator Brian is poised to unveil an upcoming exhibition at Poster House in 2026, centered on indigenous created, created works, aiming to combat erasure and decolonize design. So please, Join me in welcoming Silas and Brian to our Type of Lecture Lecture Series this spring. I'll let you take it away, Silas and Brian. I feel like we should also just like start clapping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It should be just like self I was like, well, who, are those, who are those amazing people? Oh, that's yeah, really I know. <laughs> true. Like, I'm so impressed by you. Okay. Can y'all see our screen? Okay, so we're going to be talking about polymodal tendencies, y'all. Um, really excited to be here, excited to be in dialogue with you, Brian. Do you want to give us a little overview of what we're going to talk about, Brian? Sure. Um, I also just want to start off by saying, hi, my name is Brian Johnson. As you well know, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm also coming from Raleigh, North Carolina on the unceded lands of the Lumbee tribe. I'm also a member, as one said, from the Monacan Indian Nation, which is based in Central Virginia. Um, I'll let Sal, I'll let you say anything you might want about where you are right now. But today we're gonna to talk about sort of like how Silas and I met and how we built sort of the studio that we now have, which is Polymode, how we sort of consider studio as family. We're gonna talk about what poetic research is and how that also ties into polymodal tendencies. Um, we're gonna talk about an ACMA case study, and then we're gonna get into what Polymode Sans is, the typeface that we created together um, with XYZ Type. And then we're going to show you some new recent work that we have because we're excited about it. It's pretty rad. And we just kind of want to show you how that also ties into polymodal tendencies. Uh, yeah, I'm Silas Monroe. My pronouns are he or they. Um, normally I'm in Los Angeles, which is the indigenous lands of the Chumash Tongue and Kitsch people, but I'm in Chicago 
And so actually, I just looked up, I'm on the indigenous lands of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Patawami nations. Silas and I met when we both were an undergrad at RISD um, in the very early aughts. And for me, at least, Silas and I's friendship was based on that we could be ourselves with each other. Um, I always say that I'm a very sensitive boy. I feel things in rooms, I feel things in spaces. And I feel like I never could truly be myself in a lot of places like in the world, in popular culture, um, in school. And so like when I met Silas, I felt like I could let some of these like walls and barriers down and we could both share our emotions and be queer and be ourselves and be our most authentic selves, which is really hard. And so I felt a sort of a, a kind of a kismet or sort of like a deeper bond like with Silas. And so um, for my 27th birthday, Silas here decided to take me to the opera um, to see Tristan Isolde. Um, I'm a classic nerd and opera buff. So this is kind of how we wanted to just start and show like sort of the outward facing look of how our friendship has sort of like begun and evolved. And then Silas, if you want to show the other half. Yeah, it's interesting because that I think at the time, my yeah, my boyfriend's cousin was the director of the opera. So we like had tickets to it and also David Hockney had designed the set so David Hockney was like at the opera but I feel like part of like our relationship is the realness too like yes we have a lot of kismet too but also like we try not to take each other too seriously and also like have space to also have conflict and um, not agree on things and like <laughs> enjoy all of ourselves um, and we just wanted to show a little bit of like a landscape of our friendship because it is really interesting to sort of to found a design studio on a friendship and all of the complexities and nuances that come with that I think including by holding space for each other we've learned how to hold space for our team and clients and other collaborators. So this is our full our full studio. This is Silas and I. Um, we have Renda Hadi in the center. She's an associate partner, and we have Michelle Lamb on the right and Andre Davies on the left. And this is our whole team. And when Silas and I first did a project with Mark Bradford for the Venice Biennale, Mark really showed us what it meant to have a studio become a family and have that family really feel like one, feel seen, feel appreciated. And in all honesty, this is Polymode like is a family like I care about them, but just like having an annoying brother or sister like they can grate on you and you can annoy each other and like the emotions come out, but then also like the deeper sensibilities and the trust and the understanding and the visioning and we really sort of like support these individuals and they support us because we do feel that a polymodal tendency is to design and act and collaborate as a full unit and to be able to move within those gray spaces that in all reality capitalism and the business world kind of sort of tries to destroy very sharply and bluntly and so we are actively trying to participate against that in ways that can be kind of rough on you but at the same time can also provide a lot of really good creativity and a safe place to create and to play. Yeah, and some of that has economic impacts like profit sharing as a studio, but also like time off. We close the studio for the month of August. So um, we have time to retreat and nurture ourselves as well as each other. And I think uh, a really important um, mode of making and thinking and researching that has come out of the studio is this concept of poetic research which we use in all of our projects and I think in a lot of frameworks of thinking about design process it tends to lean on the rational and the logical and poetic research says yes and the emotional and the intuitive and what are we reading what are we thinking about what is the music that we're listening to um, what is our lived experience and how might that connect to a project and help lead that. And I think one of the things that we also appreciate other than like bringing things from the margins and I think including perspectives that are not always or not have historically been included in design is also embracing the mess. Like design has a very messy part of it. And I think sometimes when the narrative is being built around design, it's like erasing that, but we actually really celebrate that. So. We just actually want to show you a couple 
screenshots of like workspaces when we're um, working on a project where all these iterations and all these permutations are being generated. And like when you actually sort of think about how we design, I do love to say it's like everything and the kitchen sink because like you truly need to be able to look at holistically all that you are thinking and feeling and looking at and listening to and watching and appreciating and getting mad at and getting frustrated with and pulling your hair out for. And so like, it's not just this final object, it's the B through Y, not the A to Z, not the A by itself and not the Z by itself. It really is sort of like the mess in the making in the middle. And so this is, uh, an iteration that just kind of shows what our creative process is with poetic research and how we also show it to clients. And so we do use Figma. Um, we sort of link everything together and then show the different sort of slides to kind of give someone like an idea of what really goes on. We actually made this for a video for an installation um, at the Scottsdale Museum of Art, just kind of showing a very sort of quick overview of just how poetic research works and what we show the client, what we walk through. So we just thought we'd show you a little quick view of what that was like. Yeah, and I think it's nice to see the kind of more processy thing, but then we do have to tell the story. So it does have to like go into this linear time, but there's so much non-linearity that's part of that. And I wanted to talk about one example of poetic research for a project that we worked on in 2021 going into 2022. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy doing and love doing since I moved to Los Angeles um, in 2016 was surfing. And I really learned to surf when I came back to LA. I lived there in grad school, but never really did it. And part of that process was I began documenting whenever I go out, I called them surf reports, which is when you're surfing, you're like taking stock of what's the wind doing? What is the quality of light? Um, how much swell is there in the water? And so this kind of personal exploration investigation lined up with this professional um, moment when the studio was asked in the fall of 2021 to help the Orange County Museum of Art redesign their identity. They were building a new building that was designed by Morphosis Architects. They were very much in flux. They had an identity they felt like wasn't resonating with them. And so part of the like pandemic time was also thinking about like, how could you re-envision this museum being under construction and opening up? A, a huge thing that was really important in addition to the new building is their collection of light and space artists. And so this idea of like light and contextual light over time became this core aspect of the identity where color would shift in different ways, depending on the light and time of day in Southern California. You can see that being applied to stationary and static instances of this light. But then there were also dynamic instances. So for two years, there was a site-specific installation on the homepage of ACMA site that had this gradient that would shift and change depending on what time of day you came to it. So morning in Southern California, but night in Berlin, um, you'd have this kind of sunlight, sunrise energy and moving through the other phases of light. This also was expanded on once the building finished construction and opened. So um, throughout the space, there is this typeface Kent designed by amazing type designer, Jamie Shapey, that lives in all these different material forms. So let's talk about what we call poly mode sands, but we know that XYZ type is now selling as poly mode. So for us, it's just a sands. Lord knows if a, if a serif will come out of this, but maybe that's an idea. So let's just talk about the typeface. <laughs> So here we have uh, four wonderful individuals that came together to make a typeface. Silas and I have been thinking for a long time that we wanted a typeface that was multifaceted. Um, and so we want to approach uh, Ben and Jesse. Jesse is in the audience, clap, clap, clap. Um, and so this is all of us working together on Polymode Sands. Ben and I had just come back from 
being at the Walker together. And so we bought um, sweatshirts for Silas and Jesse so we all could match wearing our um, Walker Art Center sweatshirts here in the Zoom meeting. And so this is what we were asking for and how, you know, we wanted something that could have a lot of different sort of needs. Like it could look good in an art book, but also as running text. It had the right amount of friction. It could be used well on a screen. Like where do you find that workhorse typeface and how do you make it? Um, we also just wanted to see, you know, how can it have, you know, a decent X height and it had to be able to flex and change. Because if you have Silas and I as partners and you have our whole studio, how could all of us bring and use this typeface and have it also mean and sound and feel like something different? Can you turn up the volume? Can you turn down the volume? Can you turn up the fade? Can you turn down the fade? Like, how can you build that into a typeface? And so that was our initial question to get started. And so, like we always like to do, and then like, you know, Jesse and Ben had asked us, they were sort of like, so if, what are you guys looking at? Like, how do you actually experience things on a day-to-day -day basis? And so here are images of type that we were looking at, people that are important to us, um, looking at Dan Friedman or Walt Whitman, thinking about art that's in, you know, in and around us, like um, braiding sweetgrass, just all the different things that we are looking at and experiencing, because it's not just about the typography, right? It's also about the emotional security or insecurity. It's like what we're moving through in our daily lives. Where are we in our entire life journey or the soul's journey? And so these are all the things like, yeah, right. How are you going to like typify all that into a typeface? But that's important to us to at least start to look at it. And of course, Jesse and Ben were like, the hell did these kids just like show to us? But this is how we start. And we hope that they could at least understand how to start funneling this into quote unquote, a simple typeface. Yeah. And I feel like that expansive, like sharing our full identities through these things that we're looking at, whether it's like the typography of Aaron Douglas or like artifacts from Uganda. I feel like there was this like really putting everything out on the table and for Ben and Jesse to hold space, like kind of the way we hold space for our clients for us and like um, sort of ask that type of qu typographic question of like, who are we? It's almost this like existential crisis in typographic form. And we did this brain dump with them uh, where we were like just thinking about the things that it wanted to feel like. So that was like the visual thing, but like we wanted to feel deliberate, but like also this idea of like mythical or like underground, like how do we have something that feels campy or stylized or like could also be that like <laughs> sliding scale of intimacy because like you know when Brian and I are just like ourselves we're like doing something a little bit differently than maybe if we're like presenting and like how could the typeface also like show this like inversion of norms and like sliding scale of like both us but the studio and even our name is very much about like many ways of working many styles many forms. So they just got into drawing. And so Jesse and Ben were like really thinking about what could this be? Like, let's just sketch it out by hand. Silas and I also like to do like really, you know, really quick layouts like by hand still. I think it's also just by training sometimes to get away from the machines, to like get back on paper, to really use the, the hand, the eye, to paper, to board, to, you know, other sort of instances. And so we loved also being able to see some of this background as well, because it just shows you like, where are we thinking? What are we drawing through? Like, what are their thoughts? Like, what is their process like? And so we just kind of wanted to show, as always, a little bit of like the behind the scenes of, you know, what was sort of going on in Jesse's and in Ben's sort of like styles while they're trying to figure out what to show us. And so this is one of the sort of opening sketches that they started with, which then turned into looking at like, well, what are some old type samples that they might want to show of us? And so where I love this sort of like gothic lining. Um, and they thought, well, we don't want to do like a, just a direct revival. And I laughed because I was like, I love that they also showed us something that says haughty bungs. And I'm just like, there are these like funny little things like mixed inside of this. I'm like, and this was made back in like what, the late 1800s. And I'm like, what is a haughty bung? And so they didn't just want to take something and just like make a revival. There was this whole conversation about how can Silas then mix in these ideas of like being polymodal and wanting to change. And then the sort of the entire conversation shifted into, well, you know, shit, we're going to have to make a variable typeface now. Like there's going to have to be, you know, there's going to have to be a different sort of axis to move this on because all that we're asking for and challenging them with 
can't just really be applied in, let's say, five or six different styles of a typeface, right? So we really had to think about what are sort of these ways of shifting and changing. And so they just wanted to show us, you know, sort of these initial pieces. And then mixing those with their sketches, it was also looking at, you know, they would show us sort of like a, a list of type here to say, you know, do you like these X heights? Do you like how these serifs are? Do you like the G's, the letters and the A's? Like, you know, do you like the, the center line form? And so just sort of looking at these different sort of samples, it was kind of like a yes, no, maybe so. I kind of like this. I don't like that. There really is a take this avenue, don't go down, you know, West 64th, like really thinking about what do we like and why, and we can have these deeper conversations with them. And then as the, oh, do you want to take that? No, or? no, go ahead, no, go ahead, yeah, please. Yeah, 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 I'm just like weaving, weaving it up in here. Um, as the direction from those concepts like started to focus, there was also this like additional expansion Two of this idea of realness and this idea of something extra or something over the top. And um, even though we sort of link it to our queerness or like our BIPOC experience, um, it also kind of is this thing that is about kind of pushing the edge of something. And so that idea of like extrema uh, or extremes in this like typographic uh, form of expression became this really interesting uh, visual language um, where we're kind of like pushing the edge of what a letter form could be or what its recognizable state is. And also wanting to make something that was like practical that has like a lot of different weights, a lot of different iterations that you can really create like complex hierarchies with. And so we just wanted to start playing. We wanted to see like, what can we actually make, you know, make with this? So I'm working on a prayer book. And so I wanted something that could be both expressive, but also have like a modicum of spirit to it. Can that also, you know, live through it and within it? And so I wanted to see like, how will it sit in like a tight little prayer book that someone's going to be holding? Like, what will that actually do? Like within my sacred geometry, how will it hold itself? Like what's too big? What's too little? Are these weights too heavy because of how I'm going to have to get my lead? These are all the things that I at least wanted to play with, thinking really deeply about the affect of book form. And next to that, you can see one of the first black grid pieces that I work on. This is a risograph for this exhibition that Ramon Tejada curated. And it was this way of like, oh, can typography and like graphic form also like speak in a form of identity that is expressed? And so that um, allowed uh, me to explore that. And I think, Brian, as we were like tinkering with this, we could start to see the possibility of like the flexibility of this typeface and like how many different forms and shapes it could take, but also where it could really like live in the world in many ways and in many projects, which um, that also meant like talking about how the weights were named. <laughs> and so I think <laughs> as like, people who have had like some pretty hardcore modernist training in terms of her design. We also did want the typeface to be able to like act basic and be neutral and mathematical and logical, but also have this sliding scale of like going to work, honey, and then having more attitude and eventually like opulence, you own everything. So these will animate here in a second, just so you can see, like we still had to really think about like, how can we, how can we show the sliding nature? How can we show like the activation of the serifs? Um, just, we also started to be able to play within showing something for ourselves. And so we started like with using um, just small little animations um, made by one of our designers, Edgar, and just really getting in there and seeing like, what can this actually do? And like, how can this sort of step out into the world and show all these different facets? And so I think the next slide has a little video to let you guys see yes. how it's gonna work out. Yep.
yes, we did fix that dumb quote from the earlier study, as you saw. <laughs> <laughs> So I, and you, I feel you like might have seen some other sort argue. of branding in there as well, right? The type yes, like this does just so <laughs> happen to use um, poly mode itself as well. And there's a wonderful use of that wonderful pink blue gradient going on. So it's glad to know that many of these things can just be shared and openly used because like, that's kind of the point, right? Like, like this is the, this is the fun of play, right? This is how that other things can come into it and it can be used and it can be sort of like out there in the real world. And we love being able to see it. Like, so, you know, we've been working with it for two or three years and now it's still out there and other people, we can't wait to find mm -hmm. other examples of it also being, you know, used in the wild. Yeah. And you could see like at the end of the video, you know, it works for like art catalogs of like uh, a sculptor that was trained as an aerospace engineer. So it can be very like rational and then, um, for Amanda Williams installation, like it can be very expressive being very extra and looking at different ways of what kind of black is this you say so that the type actually like tells the story of the content. And so um, just kudos to, to Ben and Jesse for that amazing collaboration. And yes, please license it, use it, explore it, uh, try it in your own projects. So we just wanted so let's to- look at speak... some new work. <laughs> work, work, speaking of working. Um, so we're going to talk about two um, recent projects to close. One, we're really excited about this uh, exhibition that's open at the Huntington Library, Gardens and Art Museum, which is in Pasadena. And it is a monographic exhibition for the artist sculptor, Sergeant Claude Johnson. He... Um, was very prolific and worked in many different forms and formats, very polymodal. Um, and his work um, sort of spanned the Harlem Renaissance uh, until the civil rights movement. And he traveled a lot, he referenced and went to Mexico, but also was very much inspired by glazing in Chinese um, artifacts and uh, sculptures. So he had this very interesting and curious um, way of working. And part of the poetic research for this project um, was also thinking and, and adding on to like some of the research we were already doing from BIPOC design history about this lineage of Black publications. And um, Sergeant Khan Johnson is someone who kind of like spanned these many decades and many different movements. And um, it was really that um, fire cover and Aaron Douglas's lettering that was really resonating and ended up becoming um, why we selected a typeface that Jamal Benjamin um, uh, designed called Harlem Mac. It's his contemporary revival of Aaron Douglas's lettering. And part of the fun of that uh, collaboration was also like encouraging him to like add specific additional characters to that typeface, including that very unique A with a triangle wedge in there that like felt very elemental and connected to Sergeant Claude Johnson's work, um, as well as pairing it with Pragmatic Sands by Greg Bindi, another amazing type designer, and then BTC Trey, Trey Seals' um, revival of Bernal Wolf's Pegasus. One of the things too that I think is really polymodal and like really important to us is that when working with the Huntington Library, like the team there really learned to trust us and we really learned to trust and respect them. To it, we actually could like make something different and really think about this because not only did we design the publication, we also designed the exhibition and the signage as well. And so we were able to really think about it from a very, very simple, what are the typefaces used in the publication, but also how is that visible and, you know, visual in an actual space, how you walk through it, also how is the marketing, how is it used online, you know, all the, the sort of the greater sort of story that goes along with this. And like, that is something that we have really worked towards to try to also teach to other people is that if your gut is saying that this is not a good client, what's more important, working with someone that can really trust with you and like make something beautiful or is it just about the money? And yes, we have to do things that we don't want to do to get paid and to pay our team. But at the same time, we also want to feel that we're doing something that actually can uplift a voice or really can impact someone 5, 10, 15 years from now. And so when we were thinking about sort of the exhibition is how can these images also 
show someone, show people of color, show typography, show what, what has been in and around like the historical documentation, and then let someone else also project onto it, dream about it, think about it. Have I been in a space where I put my hand like this? What is it like to be enveloped in that yellow and to feel really warm and to feel centered? And can we wrap all that together? So when you walked into the show, we wanted that through line of typography to understand Sergeant Claude Johnson's name and the use of sort of like this gold and this blue to pull us into it. And so how can we find this through line that sort of just shows and how it works using typography, allowing the type to sort of carry the message and to be the, the embodiment of Sergeant Claude Johnson's work and sort of like his physical name and type here. Yeah, I love that what you're saying, Brian, about this idea of collaboration and how like that dynamic between a designer and client can really shift how an outcome happens, but also a process. And I think that process, um, we're as proud of that as we are with a physical outcome. And um, one of the things we love that the exhibition opens with is like Sergeant Con Johnson at work, like in process of making something. And um, with this like photo mural, he's like pretty much at human scale too, which is kind of amazing. And like um, he, his just way of making is so rich. And I think part of what I also love about our studio is it also becomes this like research and development lab where we're also learning like Sergeant Claude Johnson was on my radar, like I knew about him, but the depth to which Dennis Carr and his collective of curators researched him and contextualized him also really became about color and like how color could sit in the space and how we could through typographic exploration and color exploration like disrupt the like typical idea of like what is on display and how it's displayed where at times the color and type come forward and other times they recede and create these like really beautiful moments of contrast and also have like a lot of information in them in a very clear way this is a um, sign that talks about the details of his um, way of working on this organ screen and he used a lot of gilding um, on wood, um, hence like the gold and yellow notes as well, but like trying to articulate and express a lot of information, but also make it really accessible and really easy to digest and understand. One of the things he was really interested in too is accessibility. And so he did do work for the California School for the Blind and making reliefs that individuals can also rub their hands over and feel and experience art in different ways. And so we also wanted to make sure that we had braille catalogs, we had things that people that are differently visually able to also be able to feel, you know, to really think about the entire family being able to come into the show. And it really was about like paring down the show to be simple and also engaging, allow you to sit with these objects. It, there's a lot of work there, but it feels really expansive too. That was a massive consideration to think about how to be able to sit with these objects, how to be able to let them breathe as much as we are breathing. And that kind of accessibility is really important to us mm. where we might have to turn down a client to say, well, we would prefer that you make this accessible. And if you won't, do we actually want to stay with this project? Like also thinking about how the publication is made, what are the actual, you know, uh, the production materials? We, we didn't want a lot you so lots of plastics. Like we were really thinking about how to print on this board, how to hang it. Like what is the signage like? All this is like really thinking about who is the most impacted and harmed. Like when they come to the show itself. Like can someone actually read this at a at a low light level? Like how to impact that by using yellow, by using spots, by using a, a high high contrast with that blue. We're really thinking about this the entire way through to say. I want to be able to enjoy something and make it feel, feel effortless, which is actually the most impossible and hard thing to do. And mm. I feel like that's also coming through the ethos of Sergeant Claude Johnson also really thinking about all the individuals that he's going to impact by using his own creative spirit as well. Yeah. And it's interesting because the poetic research process came full circle because there's a space as you end the show or as you're beginning, that's this reading room that has the catalog sitting in it, but then a number of other black publications um, that are um, provided by Octavia's Bookshelf, which is a local black owned bookstore in Pasadena, but then also printouts of research from our poetic 
um, research process, which it just was like a really amazing surprise, which we didn't find out about until like the show was opening. So that idea of like um, allowing your clients to even like surprise you and like um, really show how moved and impacted by our process they were, it was really mind blowing. And then also to see the impact of the exhibition in Los Angeles, which I think is really important for an institution like the Huntington, which, you know, was established through like colonial family money and now is like really trying to be an institution that's trying to open up to broader audiences and um, attract uh, different discourses and participants. And so um, they've really made an effort to really share the show with the world. So um, if you have the chance to get to LA in the next six weeks, I highly recommend seeing the exhibition in person if you can. So we want to close on a new project that we had done um, with the Airbnb's um, internal teams about like they have these groups called um, Airfinity instead of Affinity groups. And so we were tasked to see if we could make a system that can house and hold 17 different affinity groups and how each of those could bind together or you know, exist separately and what is it about sort of this ethos of Airbnb and a brand that already exists? How can we add in these levels of like Air Pride, Indigenous ad, Women at Gem Tech? Like they have all these different sort of categories. How can we give each of those categories their own kind of vibe and also make it be a huge flexible and like cohesive system? Um, this has been a year and a half, two years almost now, Silas, I've been working on this. And so uh, we are literally yeah, like, finishing up this week. Yeah, <laughs> a little over a year, a little over a year that we've been working on this project and just was like a really, I think, powerful test of the poetic research process and this idea of multiplicity that we are really aligned with and how do you make a graphic system for 17 different community perspectives of what it means to be a human being and working at Airbnb, but also be this cohesive language where they can coexist in this flexible system. And also, not only that, make it a toolkit that even a non-designer can use Google Slides and Google Tools to build it. And so that was this really incredible challenge to start off with deep poetic research interviews with um, members of each of the Airfinity groups, all 17, where we use this um, nominal group technique, which is about surfacing like everything in the room, not just like the people who want to talk uh, at the beginning. And it allowed us to really create this um, powerful system that's very human, it's very flexible, it's very vibrant, and also has accessible colors, uh, multiple accessible color palettes that are overlapping with a ton of deliverables uh, emojis and are also built around these like connective doodles that create a system of locking and interlocking. And so all of the elements in the system are modular and allow people to make their own graphics and groups to make their own graphics for um, everything from fireside chats to community hangouts and um, meetups and has this really um, also intersectional um, part of the identity where multiple groups also often um, co-organize and um, create uh, discussions and programming that uh, overlap with each other. We also started by thinking about sort of, you know, the, the Airbnb Balo and what happens when you unravel it and how when you unravel metal, it also holds the sort of like where it's been shaped and shown before. And that's where this whole idea of unraveling, re-raveling came about, because these are the things that bind us together as humanity, right? Culture, being real, understanding what it means to be our authentic selves, and then to share that experience. And so we then had to think about how does this then interact with others and like how can these colors look and feel and be accessible and you can see that really when we get into the 17 different um styles here it flexes out and this took a lot of work um there's a lot of crazy involved figmas mech files um iterations cascading problems like it is real and i 
sounds like I even see a mistake on the slide too. <laughs> can anyone like, can anyone notice it? Um, it's just things like that where you're always iterating and finding and testing and like figuring out like what things are. And like, that's why I also love to do this project and to work with these teams is that it really challenged us, but then it also truly gave us a place to play. And we could really like test our own grit as a team working with Airbnb, which has been a great experience and a great client. Their ground control team is really, really awesome. Um, because of course, you know, started by another RISD grad. So you can kind of see how all these things do sort of cascade and live around. But like, this just truly gave us a moment to say, like, how can we still be poly mode and be Airbnb and come together and make something that we think is like fun and new, especially for us and hopefully for them as well. They seem quite thrilled about it. And we'll just close with the video that really shows kind of the um, kind of DNA and articulation and structure underneath the system. Y'all. And that's it. That's a little a little taste of some polymodal tendencies. Woohoo. This is so Should much I... fun. Thank you. Thank you both so much for, yeah. for sharing. Should I stop the share, Brian? Uh, yes, we can just yes, kind of... yes, sure. Yes. We can see our nice big faces. Yeah, and then we can like <laughs> get the, get the questions from the Q and A and see. Yeah, we have, we have a few questions. Asking. Can you can you both see the questions? Um, I'll, I'll can, I can read, or you 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 can pick and choose. I can't see the questions. I don't see them on the screen. So yeah, you just go ahead. Actually, oh, yeah, I can. Duh. <laughs> Hi, Ashna. Thank you. So maybe I'll start with the first one, uh, which is a, it's a very interesting question. And I think that it gets to the heart of this, this talk. Um, so Patrick asks, uh, when you say that your firm is a family, uh, I believe it. But I don't believe it when lots of other companies say it. <laughs> Um, how do you make sure your firm family is the good kind and not the kind that's actually a corporate lie? Well, I can tell you how it's not a corporate lie because maybe we don't have corporate money. We don't get paid in corporate ways and we are not that corporate. Like we are not a huge conglomerate that like I have a second home and I always like, you know, take off time and like go to the beach for two months. Like, and I, it, we really do like we have gut checks is this the right kind of client are we actually be treating and are we treating them and are they treating us in appropriate ways like do we actually want to spend our time to work with certain clients that treat us as we want to be treated that trust us and we trust them but then it's the interpersonal dialogue it's like when you're having a bad day like we really ask this like at the beginning of the week when we have traffic like we say like what you do this weekend how are you? Like, what is your emotional and physical traffic? And if I say, you know, like, I'm holding a lot of space for my mother in law, and I'm going to be there for her. And so I might be slightly distracted, I can bring my whole self and the team might be Oh, mm -hmm. Brian's a little extra grouchy, because he's worried about something else. It's not us, they can still let me be real, but it doesn't stop me from doing my work. I just wanted to let them know, hey, you know, this is going to be here with me today. Do you mind? And so I feel like that's how we kind of keep it real is that we try to make sure that we can be that be those people while working, but also still get the work done and also still say, actually, y'all, I need some screen free time, I'm going to go take a walk. Can I like, can I be on this call while walking? I need to take care of my physical body, right? It's little small things like that, that we, we try to make sure that our humanity is still intact. Yeah, I think that's the power of vulnerability and transparency. Like, I think we really do a good job of unpacking and being able to like work through things that are hard. We also have this format we call tender buttons where like there's something that like happened in the studio, whether it was like between team members or it's with a client where it would just like didn't sit well with someone. It just allows like a space to be like, oh, this was like 
really tender for me and I want to just talk through it and unpack it and how do we like process that as a studio so I think um that's really important I think the other thing I would say is I don't know if it's just because a lot of us on the team are educators and really interested in education that learning has become part of our workflow as a studio and I feel like that really is an antidote to this idea of like corporatization even as we do like projects for larger clients like Airbnb. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I like the concept of tender buttons. Very interesting. And they, they can be really tender sometimes. I can be like, I have a big tender button and it will like pause the meeting for like 30 minutes and we'll all unpack it. I mean, it's, you get really vulnerable really fast because there are times where in public, I'm like, hey Silas, what you did, X, Y, and Z and unpack it and he can turn right around and say hey you hurt my feelings when and it it's right there and you have to really kind of get into it but we really do think that that is what makes good work makes for a good work environment and it also shows just how real we actually want to be wow thank you thank you again uh we have a couple more questions uh we have like 10 minutes left and another question just popped up so um, this is one by Debo. Uh, she said, love learning the process of polymode sands. Why did you choose to create a new typeface? And I'm gonna mix it with another another question that goes after because they're related. Um, so the first one is why did you choose to create it? And the second one is a little bit more about how deep do you go conceptually and have you ever presented an ornate typeface pushing the visual perspective to a client? I can start with the why which actually came, I think, more from you, Brian, than me when we were like starting to get deeper into what the studio can be and how to express it. And we actually had this experience. Um, this is also something that Brian implemented <laughs> in the studio, which is a postmortem at the end of a project. We like unpack what happened and it's kind of like the tender button version of like, but for the client, but it's also like a celebration of the wins and like what worked well and what didn't work well and how could we improve our process. And the last question we ask is, will you work with us again? And we had a client who's a curator who said, yes, if you quit your day jobs. <laughs> and so we were like, oh shit, I like really lit some fire under our ass. And so we were beginning this process of like, what would that look like to transition out of a full-time teaching or full-time like running a marketing design department would look like and part of that creating the ethos of the studio was like brands like I, we really need a typeface like we, it's not just enough to have like a color palette or a brand but we actually need something that is typographic form that can tell the story of polymode it's been not only an amazing idea but it's also been a really important tool for us expressing who we are but then also like using it in client projects. I don't know, Brian, if you want to talk about how how we actually like get people to choose Polymode Sands because it's been a lot oh, of different projects. Absolutely. But I also think this this is a good thing to say. Though it was a collaboration, we paid XYZ. Like we bought that and mm -hmm. said, we need, we need y'all's mm. expertise to make this for us. How much would this cost? And mm. then we paid them. So yes, it was a collaboration, but there's also a fine line also drawn, right? And also a very blade line. You will pay us X for this many hours and we will do this with it. And this is what we can consider, right? So like good fences make good neighbors and like that's a good way of like establishing that boundary. And so when we said this is what we want and this is what that value is, that was really important to us. Conversely from XYZ, it also was, okay, well, how can we also then resell it? So, you know, Polymode had the use of it explicitly for a couple of years, and then it was also then sold, you know, by XYZ. So like, there are like other business constraints woven into that, that also gave that flexibility, but we didn't want something to just be for us. Like that was the whole idea of that collaboration, right? Like you can make something better when you pour more minds into it that also support each other. And that was like a, a solid sort of point. Well, and when we saw like the estimate too, we were like, gulp, can we like really do that? And it was like, a, it was a big expenditure for us, like at that point in the studio and it was worth every dollar and every minute. So, yeah. And to the ornate question, 
there was one typeface that Michelle, our senior designer, wanted to use in a project. And she kept dropping this and go poetic research. Like, I want to use this ornate typeface. It was swishy. It was swashy. It had like hanging things. It was amazing. Got turned down four, five, six times. And then on that one time, the client goes, I think that's really hot. I want to play with that typeface. So you just have to keep pulling those types out there and say, I mm -hmm. want to use this. I want to use this. And eventually you will have one client that goes, I want that. And it will happen. And it can be persnickety and ornate and different and really far out there. And the client's like, I want that. And you really have to yeah, then run and say, yes, someone trusts me. And that's the that thing. Right. That's what you kind of want. We, we also have had clients or prospective clients told us that we're too fussy, you know, like, so it can go the range. And I think it's about like, um, like believing in your own aesthetic and like knowing that sometimes you do shift or adjust that, but that you over time can really start to craft a, a visual language that people are going to be wanting to come to you for. Thank you. Those were really great answers. Um, we have uh, two last questions. Um, they're both from Tiffany. The first one is, how do you choose the type for the Orange County Museum of Art? Um, and the second one is a little bit more, perhaps a little bit more open-ended. Uh, uh, this says the poetic research seems thoughtful and thorough, but it seems like it takes a bit of time. Have you found the studio's process at odds with the client's timeline? Does grounding the team with a strong intention and mindset from the get-go of a project make, make down the line decisions, making and designing more efficient in a way that it makes up for the time spent on research phase? Do you want me to talk about the type for Orange County oh, Museum oh, first? Yeah, and then you I, want to get I, into I would, the, the, yes, the second get weekend into the of the time. Sharing. Yep, yep. That is really, that is the tea. Um, so yeah, for the Orange County Museum of Art, there were a few different typefaces that we were ideating with um, that was kind of bridging the poetic research phase into the concepts. Um, one of them was plan grotesque, which is like Typotech, um, uh, Type Foundry, uh, Peter Bielak's collective, um, which had a stencil version of it. And it was very architectural and kind of condensed. And then I think there's like one other forerunner, but Jamie Shapey, who was, I think, just like graduating from CalArts in her undergrad, but she had also done type at Cooper as well. And like also had done her own typeface, was developing this typeface. I think she was just like sharing little fragments of it on social media. Um, and the fact that it was called Sister Creative Kent, or is referencing Sister Creative Kent, who's like this icon of, um, art and design in Southern California. Plus it also had the stencil, plus the forms of the typeface very much echoed this terracotta tile. Like we showed you like only a sliver of the product research for this project that um, Morphosis was experimenting with as like a, a nod to like histories of tile and like um, architectural structures in Southern California, um, which also have like their you know, lineages and, you know, California is like part of Mexico. So, um, so that, that like way that it was something that was about like materiality and like carving and printing, but also something that felt very futuristic at the same time made it a really great choice um, for the identity. And even though we don't work with the museum anymore, it's become like their house typeface. And I think that's really amazing that when that kind of intention comes together and sticks, even when it's a risk. So timing, money, my favorite things is a Capricorn. Yes, polymode, like to do a polymode poetic research takes a lot more time than the client might want to pay for. So then we have to then eat that. Or we turn to the client and say, this is how much our process is gonna really take. Some clients think that that's awesome, that they are paying us to be a great studio that teaches them and educates them and grounds their understanding of the question and the object they ask for us to make to also pull them into the actual experience and to understand what's going on. 
I am a taskmaster with time. Do not waste my time. Do not waste my energy or my spirit or anything that I'm putting into something. Because if I'm giving you 100% of myself, you better give me the same or this is not going to work out. So yes, we spend more time to do that poetic research, but when you measure twice and then cut once, when you get further down the line into the actual design, you are not double timing or like wondering, is this right? Is this in like, are we in the right space? Like you might still need to question those things later on, but because you have such a strong foundation, the client has seen where it has come from, why you have chosen these things. What are you making? Why are you making them? What is the rationale for the grid, the type size, how it's hanging off a certain scale? All of this is like, it's why it's there. But I also have to get on the team to say, you are wasting time here. This is not important. So there's that fine line between studio's family where I'm just like, I love that you're sitting here eating popcorn and watching TV and you're doing this great research, but why am I paying you to do your own research when we need to be working for the client, right? It's a fine line. But at the same time, when we're also unearthing so much cool and information and like stuff that like gives us passion, that then might tie into another project. And so it's this whole idea that the ripple is actually going to carry you forward. But I also think that's why we're not a corporate sort of entity. Like we make really what we consider to be well-made work that will withstand time and space. It's not bubble gummy. It's not supposed to be churn and burn work. And that's not what Polymode is and or does. We are also turned down many times because our cost is too expensive. We are actually like, we need more time, but like we have to then let that go and say, I hope you find the exact right designer for you. It's just not us this time. And that's okay. Like, but do we still need some money? Yeah, we have money crunches at Polymode. We get nervous, like, when's the next client going to show up? Why is this person not paying on time? Business is still real. And so sometimes we have to take the, the projects that we don't necessarily want to because we just have to pay the bills. But we are hoping that all the ones that come in we are so impassionate about that we can just make good work. And you can find that good work everywhere. Sometimes in poetic research, we build that deck in, like, two days. Sometimes those decks are months of research put into it. Like Airbnb was a deep, deep, deep dive and they paid for that. Right. And so like, it's really, it's, it kind of just goes back and forth. I don't know. We're a minute over. So yeah. <laughs> unless you want to respond to that. I just want to, I do. I want to add, cause I feel like it also does create a deeper value for the project. And I think it's a deeper value for the studio and you feel it underneath that. And so I think that, grappling with issues of time and money and also like from an indigenous perspective like linear time is not real <laughs> so it's like i think there are aspects of it where it is kind of like a bit mystical in the sense that it has something and it's creating something that's deeper than this idea of a list of deliverables that it is something that's creating an ethos it's creating an energy and it's something that is a feedback loop and it's something we also do workshops with. So it's it's also an exchange with a client, not just a thing we're handing off or offering as a fee for service. Amazing. Uh, well, with that, I just wanna say thank you both so much, Silas and Brian. Uh, I really appreciate how real and open you both have been especially when describing poetic <laughs> research and, you know, the actual value that it brings to the design process. And I really appreciate how you are, how you all work and everything that you've shared with us. So yeah, thank you all again. If it was in person, I say everyone give a big round of applause. Uh, but with this, I'm going to let you all go. Uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you all for the questions. Uh, take care, everyone. We'll see you at the next lecture. Bye. Bye, y'all.